Hi everyone, back again with another video on Kubernetes. I am Dinut. We are focusing on how to get through certified Kubernetes application developer certification in this video series. If you haven't watched my previous videos, I will include the link in the description. Today we are discussing on state persistence domain uh, in this CKAD curriculum and that will give you 8% of marks during the exam. So let's get it started. Containers were developed to be stateless, ephemeral, lightweight tools, only megabytes in size to speed up the application launch. However, this design is problematic when it comes to the data persistence because when the container goes away, you will lose the data that you have written into that file system of the container. To ensure the data persisted well beyond this container's life cycle, the best practice is to separate the data management from the containers. Kubernetes has multiple ways to do this. Kubernetes persisted volumes, persistent volume claims, storage classes are used to solve this problem. Before going into these topics, let's look at this example. Here in this pod definition, I'm creating a file in the containers opt number.out location with a random number. When we connect to the container shell with the exec command and check the file content, we can see that there's a random number generated, number is 95, and we can see it in this file. We can persist this file into Kubernetes nodes disk by adding a host path volume like this. We have used volumes in our previous discussions as well using config maps, secrets, how to mount those secrets or config maps as volumes. We can define host path volume directly in the pod definition under the volume section. My volume mapping name is data volume. Then I can define the host path volume configurations with path and type. In my node, I need to save this data into temp data folder because of the I'm adding host path location is temp data. And my type is a directory. If the directory is not available, I need to create this directory because of that as a type, I'm using directory or create. You can find out more details about host path volume in the Kubernetes documentation. Here I am using it as an example. This volume needs to be mounted into the container. Now we need to mount it into the OPT path because of that we have the volume mount section by pointing it to the, our volume name as well as mount path is OPT. When we make the configuration like this, it will make sure that number.out file in the container is persist to the node disk slash temp slash data number.out location. Now let's delete the pod, recreate and check the file again. Then we can see that two random numbers are saved into this file, 95 and 48 because 95 got written in our previous pod and then 48 written into this file in this new pod instance. That means no matter our previous pod got deleted, data that we have generated within that pod was persisted into this nodes disk storage. Please note that in your Kubernetes cluster, if you have multiple nodes and if the new pod got scheduled in a different node, you will not be able to see the content persisted with the previous pod with this host path volume type. Now let's move in to another example. In this example, we are looking at empty DIR volume type. Empty DIR volume data is persisted as long as the pod is running in that node. All containers in the pod can read and write the same files in the empty DIR volume by mounting the volume to the containers within the pod. When the pod is removed from the node, the data in the empty DIR is deleted permanently. That means you can use empty DIR for a stretch this kind of a scenario. In this example, I have two containers. Container one is writing a file into app message.text location and within the container two, I'm trying to access the same message by mounting the empty DIR volume into different places in the container one and container two. In the container one, empty DIR volume is mounted into app 
path but in the second container I am mounting it into the OPT path. So because of that the content written into app message.text location that data can be accessed in the container too with the slash opt message.txt file. Creating the storage definitions directly in the pod is a little bit hard to manage. Now let's look at how to do this in a more controlled and managed way. Administrators can create the persistent volumes for centrally manage all the storage solutions and the users, the developers can create persistent volume claims to mount it into the pods. Volumes are created within a file system with the size, with some characteristics such as volume IDs and the names. A Kubernetes persistent volumes has following attributes. It is provisioned with either dynamically or by an administrator. We will be talking about how to do that with the manual provisioning as well as with the dynamic provisioning and it is created with a particular file system as an example if you are having a kubernetes cluster in aws you can use aws ebs and in azure you can use azure disk or azure files in gcp you can use gce persistent disk in on-premise you have the options of using nfs storage host path or local storage kind of options and also these volumes has a particular size whether that is 10 GB or 5 GB or 50 GB you can define that and also it has the characteristics such as what is my volume ID and the name based on your storage provider and also need to mention that it has access modes based on the supported storage provider such as read write once we call it RWO mode by the name implies you can use it for both read and write but the volume can only be mounted into one knot in your Kubernetes cluster. Read only many ROX mode can be used only for read only access but it can be mounted into multiple nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. The other mode is read write many RWX. Uh, you have both read write access and the volume can be mounted into multiple nodes in your Kubernetes cluster with that access mode. You need to check the volume provider documentation for what are the supported access modes. So as you see in this diagram, EBS volumes, Azure disk, host path supports read write once access mode only. But when it comes to NFS volumes, uh, which supports all of these access modes. Here are two examples of persistent volumes. You can see we have the kind persistent volume and we can provide a name uh, under the metadata and under the spec section, you can define what are my access modes? It can be multiple access modes as well. And the capacity we can define, it is one gig at this moment. And then based on the volume type, there will be different configurations. If it is AWS, you can use AWS Elastic Block Storage. And after that, you can define its configurations like volume ID and the FS type. So if you want to use the same kind of scenario where host path needs to be used, you can use host path and then provide what is my path. So these are just uh, some examples. You can go into the documentation and find out more details about what are the configurations, what are the additional volume types that can be used in these definitions. Need to mention one more thing here. After consuming the volume, what to do with the volume is defined using the reclaim policy under the spec persistent volume claim policy section. Persistent volumes can have various reclaim policies including delete, retain and recycle. In the delete reclaim policy, deletion removes both the persistent volume object in the Kubernetes as well as in the associated storage asset in the external infrastructure like in AWS EBS, Azure Disk or etc. When you use the retain policy, when the persistent volume claim is deleted, the persistent volume is still exist and the volume is considered released. With few additional steps, the administrator can make this volume available for another mount into a pod. Recycle reclaim policy is used to make sure this volume is available when it is released from a claim and this is deprecated and now you need to use dynamic provisioning instead of using this recycle reclaim policy. 
Once you have the persistent volume YAML definition, you can apply it using kubectl apply minus f and the file name or kubectl create minus f file name. After that, the volume will be created and you can find out what are the volumes available using kubectl get pv command. After creating the volume, what next? To make this persistent volume available to mount to a pod, you need to create a persistent volume claim. Every persistent volume claim is bounded into a single persistent volume. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Kubernetes will try to find out the persistent volume with the sufficient capacity, access modes and volume modes, storage classes as you requested in the claim definition as you see it in the example. If you look at here, I am creating the kind persistent volume claim. I will be providing my name into my claim and under the spec section, you will be defining the configurations to match with your persistent volume definitions. So if you have a storage class, you can define that. Access modes, you will be defining to match with the persistent volume access modes and you can define the storage. In this example, PV persistent volume has 10 gig storage, but PVC persistent volume claim is consuming less storage. In this kind of a situation, other claims will not be able to use the remaining capacity of your volume. Additionally, you can use labels and selectors as well to bind the volume with the persistent volume claim. If you look at this example, you can provide persistent volume labels in the persistent volume claim selector field to bind the correct persistent volume into the persistent volume claim. Now you are ready to use this persistent volume claim in your pod definition. So according to the example, you can create a volume section. Under that volume section, you can provide an arbitrary name and your volume type would be persistent volume claim and then you can provide what is my claim name under the claim name definition. Afterwards, you have the volume defined. You can mount it into anywhere in your container using volume mounts configuration. In all of these examples, we have discussed how to create the persistent volumes, persistent volume claims and mount it. Everything we did it manually. We call it as manual provisioning. If there is a manual provisioning, there should be a dynamic provisioning as well. Dynamic provisioning uses an API object called storage classes, where you configure a provisioner to dynamically create these persistent volumes when requested using a persistent volume claim, PVC. So these storage classes are created as part of the bootstrapping process of the Kubernetes cluster by the administrator. So the main goal of storage classes is to eliminate the need of the cluster administrator to pre-provision the storage to allow them to be created on demand. So the users can then request storage by specifying the storage class and the size of the volume needed in their persistent volume claims. The administrator can create one or many storage classes depending on which type of storage options they support or want to make it available for the users to consume. For an example, the administrator might create two flavors, fast backed by SSD disk and slow backed by hard disk HDDs. When you want to define a storage class, you will be using the kind storage class under the metadata you can provide. What is my storage class name? Here are uh, the two examples. The first one is slow and the second one is fast. So the parameters needs to be different between these two storage classes. So under the provisioners, I'm defining what is my provisioner here. I'm in the Google Cloud Platform because of that I'm using GCE PD as the provisioner and under the parameters I'm defining if I need to provision some volumes with the slow storage class, I need to use PD standard. In that case, it will use hard disk but when it comes to the fast storage class, I'll be using PD SSD. That means it will be backed by SSD storage. So when you have the storage classes defined, you don't need to create the PVs, persistent volumes manually because storage class will make sure the PVs are dynamically provisioned when you create the persistent volume claim object in your Kubernetes cluster. So when you 
deploy a claim, Kubernetes will try to find the PV that matches the claim criteria and then bound it into the PVC and it will not be released until the PVC is deleted. So this is how the PVC would look like to consume this storage class. You will have the kind persistent volume claim in the same way and then you will be defining a claim name and under the resources you can define what how much storage that I want to request and you can define the access modes as well as that you can define the storage class name if you define it as fast it will create a persistent volume with the ssd storage and if you use the storage class name as slow it will use hard disk storage as we define in our storage class definitions when you want to mount this persistent volume claim into the pod you can use the same approach that we have discussed earlier by creating a volume pointing it into your persistent volume claim by providing the claim name and you can mount it into your containers using the volume mounts section. Right, that's all about the state persistence. During this video, we have discussed how to do the volume configurations directly in the ports volume section using host paths, empty DIR kind of approach. You can use the same approach for the EBS volumes and the other types as well. And then we talked about how to make it centralized, um, easily manageable approach using persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, and using it in the pod definitions. Then we discussed how to do the dynamic provisioning using storage classes and persistent volume claims and then mounting it in the pods. If you have not yet subscribed into my channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button followed by the bell sign. And let's meet in another video until that. Bye-bye.